Good morning. How are we doing this fine Sunday morning? <laughs> We're chatty, anyway. <laughs> I know it's cloudy, and is that snowing? Oh, my soul, give it up. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty, but I mean, spring is coming, so that's good. I uh, want to welcome everybody here and everybody online. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have um, our first one that we're doing this morning um, is What a Beautiful Name. And it's, I know it's a little bit of a newer one, but we've done it a couple of times now. And I just want to bring out a line from that. And it, it really struck me. Like, I, I know I've been singing it over and over, and it's like, oh, that's what that says. So it says, you didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. So let that soak in a little bit that we were, it was dismal without him, right? And then he sent his son. And now we have eternal. So please stand and join us. Your 
Good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, happy to have you here with us on this beautiful snowy day. <laughs> Some One of these days is going to be the last time it snows this year, and then we're all going to be like, man, I really miss the snow, right? <laughs> maybe, I'm hearing a few no's, maybe not. <laughs> 
Well, we're happy that you're here with us this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us or if this is your first or second time here, we just want to welcome you especially. Uh, there's some Connect cards in the seats in front of you. Uh, if, if you want to fill one of those out and bring it over to the office, we have a little something for you. Um, just looking for uh, events and activities going on over the next little while. Uh, so this Wednesday morning, and we've been doing this over the last few weeks here at the church, just in this Lent season, um, we're having a prayer time here, uh, just over in the prayer room on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., uh, just preparing our hearts for, for Easter and all of that. So if you want to come up to that, feel free. Um, Easter extravaganza. So that's coming up pretty quick because that's on April 1st, and we're already at the 19th, so there's only so many days left until that's happening. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be happening on April 1st. Uh, it's going to be a really fun time uh, for our kids. We're still taking donations for candy, so as you came in today, you probably saw out in the front uh, just that table with all the candy on it. So we've got lots of candy right now. Really hard not to eat it, but I'm trying my best. Uh, and so uh, we could still use more donations, so if you have any candy lying around or if you want to go pick some up and bring it over, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, and then one other thing, this Tuesday, so this Tuesday coming up this next week, uh, we're going to be at Neighborhood Works. Uh, our crew is going to be doing it this week, so uh, feel free to come on out to that. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to pray for our kids uh, in the offering, and then we're just going to head on over for that. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's talk to God. Dear God, just thank you for bringing us all here today. Uh, thank you for bringing us to your house to worship you. I just thank you for the worship team that's been leading us so well uh, here this morning and all the mornings. Uh, they just do such an awesome God, so awesome job, so we thank you for them, God. Uh, God, we thank you for the offering that's going to come in today. I uh, just thank you for everyone who donates, not just with money, but with time. Uh, both are really important uh, things as we just continue to do your work here and further the kingdom in our community, God. So thank you for that. Uh, God, I just pray that as our kids said over this morning that you would just be uh, with them and with their leaders, that you would just teach them what, they, what you want them to learn, um, and that they would just have a fun time over there. Thank you, God, for all this. Pray all this in your name. Amen. All right, well, the pastoral team and the deacons were pretty brave to give me the mic for five or ten minutes this morning. So you guys at the back, give me a, give me a five when I'm at five and a, and a ten when I'm at ten. Okay. Yeah. And after that, start, I don't know, do something to Mike or something. Um, all right, let me uh, get an initiative that I want to talk to you guys about. I'll, I'll kind of hit you with the, real, the basics real first, what it is, and then, um, then I'll start filling in details and then those guys will start giving me five and ten minute warnings. Um, Forty days of intentional prayer in the prayer room, morning, afternoon, and evening. That's the summary. That's not bad. I'm not good at summarizing, but I, I had a little bit of help with that. Forty days of intentional prayer in the prayer room, morning, afternoon, evening, times seven, all week. Times 40, I guess. Do some math today. Um, why prayer? There's a nice quote up there that someone wiser than I came up with, but we thought that it, uh, it I, I, I figured I didn't need to try to convince you guys about why pray. It's the, the audience is probably already fairly accustomed to the fact that prayer is part of being a believer, uh, but, but the power of it, like why pray, what does prayer look like? Oswald Chambers says, prayer is not a preparation for work, it is the work, but for those of us that like to do, we want to just do, come up with good ideas, make things happen. We can muscle our way through things. That's what we do at work. It's what we do, you know, in our family lives. But in, in the spiritual life, prayer is the work. So it's hard to switch and, 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 and devote too much time to prayer because then the, the temptation is, well, what do we get done? What do we accomplish? Prayer is the work. It is the battle. Prayer is twofold, a definite asking and definite waiting to receive. So that'll, that'll stay up there for five or ten minutes. And, uh, but, so it... So that's, that's why prayer. Four questions. Why prayer? Why 40 days? Why the prayer room? And why now? So I have a few notes here to try to keep me on track. And I'll see if I read them or not. Um, why 40 days? There's actually, a, there's actually a little bit of an interesting story with 40 days. I'm not going to really get into it, but there's a 40 day, a, definitely a biblical precedent for 40 days. And um, 
there's a, whenever 40 days is mentioned in the Bible, there's always something challenging that leads to a spiritual growth. And so, uh, and there's countless examples of this in scripture. Um, but it gives us a time to start, kind of focus for 40 days. That doesn't mean we should stop praying after 40 days, but it gives us uh, a bookend to this initiative. Not that we should stop, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of reevaluate as far as how this goes and what does the 40 days look like and what happens after that. That's to be determined. We'll see. But um, well that's the, uh, the basics anyway. Why the prayer room? Like we can pray anywhere. That's the idea. God's everywhere, so we can pray anytime. Um, so then why do we go over here when we could just stay home and pray there? There's an intentionality about coming in to pray. Not that it has to be here. That's not the Holy of Holies anymore. Once upon a time, it might have been. Uh, not in our generation, but, um, uh, but once upon a time, it really was like that. Old Testament stuff, there was a spot. Um, it's Holy of Holies here now. And so it begs the question, why come here then? But there's an intentionality, and there's a sacrifice that we give that's still honored by God. When you give up something to intentionally focus on God, there's a, there's a blessing that comes with that. That'll happen in your personal lives with the Lord, and that'll happen in our corporate life with the Lord. And so that's why we're focusing on the prayer room. Again, there's nothing magical about that room. It has nice stained glass windows that's reminiscent of yesteryear. That's nice. But it's not about that room. It's about the sacrifice that it takes for us to intentionally come into here because if we were going to, let's say we're going to come in to pray, we're going to sign up, what it's going to look like is 21 slots in the, in the run of a week, morning, afternoon, evening. And what we're going for is, let's see if we can fill those up. Doesn't mean you have to come in and pray for four hours. You might come in and pray for five minutes. But somebody was here that morning praying intentionally. And may, it may have taken, ironically, 30 minutes to organize yourself to get in here for five minutes. But that's part of prayer because that's sacrifice. And so we're giving up something, giving up convenience, giving up time, giving up what makes sense. It's not efficient. It's more efficient to pray at home, and we should. But for this, consider signing up for one of those 21 slots to come in here for intentional prayer as a sacrifice, giving up something for God. Um, think about in our, own, in our own relationships, our human relationships, with your, with your friends. We'll say, we'll say friends, like work friends. There's a difference between showing up to work, talking with your work buddy, but the schedule brought you together. It's the next level from that is you and your work buddy made time after work to get together. It's an intentionality. You gave up something. It's the same with God. He's very relational. That's why we're relational. We, we are, we're image bearers of God. And so when we give up something to intentionally be with the Father... There's a blessing that comes with that. You may not feel it. I mean, I, we, we have to be careful how, what we presuppose blessing to be. I feel so wonderful. Maybe, or maybe not. Suffering is a blessing, too. We don't like that one. I don't, anyway. Um, why now? Begs the question, why now? Uh, don't we pray anyway? We have, you know, prayer at different times throughout the week, and it's like, why now? Um, God's at work. And we want in. There's God stirring. Some of you have felt it in your own spirits. Some of you feel it in the atmosphere in this room. Um, maybe you've been talking with some other folks from other churches. And God's on the move. Not just in Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. Although that was pretty spectacular. That's the real deal. Uh, but that type of stuff has happened all over the place. And... If your feelers are out there in the community, in the churches, that's going on here in Atlantic Canada. That's going on here in Charlotte County. And it's going on in here. And we want more of that. And the way to get into more of that is more of God. And the way to get more of God is intentional prayer. Prayer is a powerful weapon. And so we're going to focus on prayer for 40 days. We're going to look for, you can pray about anything. Pray about, pray about whatever the Lord puts on your heart. But, some, but we, want, we want God to stir and revive and awaken or fresh move. Whatever label we want to put on it probably depends on the denomination that we meet on Sunday mornings. But we want God to move, and we want in on it. And so we better sacrifice, do something to make sure that we're in on it. And 
Uh, again, this is, there's a thousand things we can do. One of them, though, and a powerful one, is prayer. And so this, is, this kind of allows us to all be part of something bigger than ourselves, of course, which prayer is anyway. But corporately, it's like we're all coming together every, every day, three times a day. Um, we wouldn't all be in the room at the once. So that would be great, you know, 500 people in there trying to squish in. That would be wonderful. But, but e- e- the idea is to have 21 slots, morning, afternoon, evening, with somebody representing those slots throughout the week. And again, you don't have to fill it for three hours of prayer. Go ahead. But it might be five or seven minutes. It's okay. You stay for as long as the Lord puts it on your heart to stay. And if somebody else shows up, good. Pray together. If you don't like praying out loud, okay, both of you pray silently. All right, that's a good problem. So I encourage you to consider this as something that might fit into your week as we uh, move forward with this. Um, a precursor to good things happening is there's a theme where God comes where he's wanted. I encourage you to want him in your own life and as a body here. That we grow not just in number, but that we, we want him to grow not so that we, I don't know, pay the bills faster. That's a bonus, I guess. But, but, it's, uh, but we, we want to grow because we want God's kingdom to come. We want people, to, we want people to, to have a better life. We want people to live deeply with the Lord. And so in order to do that, we need the Spirit moving. How do we move, how do we move the hand of God? It's prayer. And so we need to be praying. Pray, pray at home. Pray as much as you want at home. Be sensitive to a Spirit's leading. But consider coming in here one time a week to pray for a few moments, whatever those moments are. And uh, we're going to meet this, after, or this evening at 6.30. For any of you guys that are interested in getting more information, there's a sign-up form, a clipboard that I'll kind of put maybe in the prayer. I'll put in the prayer room. Uh, well, maybe, yeah, I probably should. We'll put in the prayer room uh, kind of after service. So if you want to sign up for, for a slot for the week, sign up and come on in. Um, and if you want to come this evening at 6.30 to get some more information, we're going to pray together tonight. And we're going to um, uh, talk logistics. If anybody has any questions about, hey, what about this or what about that? And there'll be a few of us around that can, can try to answer that type of stuff. We've been thinking about this a little bit and putting things together. So it should be able to work out pretty good. But there's an opportunity, this, again, this, uh, this evening, 6.30 till 7.30, to, uh, to ask some questions, show up together, and see if we can get things, um, get things rolling. Uh, feel free, again, to sign up. You don't have to be here tonight in order to pray, of course. If you want to sign up, sign up before you leave today. You want to come tonight, get some more information, then sign up. Do that, please. But we anticipate um, a good uh, a good meeting tonight that's going to be more characterized probably by prayer than figuring out logistics. Although we want that opportunity to be able to talk out uh, any questions and and and, and kind of concerns or perspectives that may be may be there for uh, as we move forward with this. So we want a hunger, we want a deepening, we want the Holy Spirit drawing us in, and repentance. Before God moves, or there's often, when, do, when God moves deeply, there's often repentance that precedes it, where we're bending our, our knee to the Lord. And so we're asking for that, that the Lord would do that in our hearts. This is a final scripture before I sit down and relinquish the microphone. The Lord put this on my heart this week, and I didn't know why. For some reason, he linked it to this prayer uh, stuff going on this, over the next 40 days. I'm like, I'm not sure why, Lord. It is in Isaiah 40, but it, I thought that might have been a little coincidental. Um, but, it's, uh, but, he, but through prayer, it's, all, it's Isaiah 40, starting at verse 3, just a three, three, four verses. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Prayer does that. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God, or straight paths for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. So you do when you make roads, highways. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. If we do this, the glory of the Lord will be revealed when we work like that with his leading. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? Let's not worry about what we're crying out about. Let's just make sure we're crying out. 
So I encourage you at home, of course, to pray. I don't want to stuff that out. But I, I encourage you to consider um, choosing one of the 21 slots this week and for the next 40 days. You don't have to commit to the 41 days. Just will you sign up? And if you want more information, 6.30 tonight, we'll talk it over. The end. Thank you, Josh, for that. Um, we're going to move into the second um, part of the worship, so please stand with us if you can. Um, the second one, uh, Juliana actually uh, introduced it to our congregation. So um, it's oh, come to the altar, and uh, with with Easter coming up, it's a it's a grand reminder. So let's worship. <coughs>
Say hey. 
Wonderful. Let us uh, continue in worship and prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together, that we have access to your throne room by the blood of Jesus, God. We thank you, God, that is nothing that we have done, God, but is what Jesus has done that allows us to come confidently, boldly into your throne room, that you have invited us in. And we thank you, God, for the incredible privilege of being able to come and worship through singing, through our offering, and through prayers, through greeting one another. We thank you, God, that you are here in our midst. May you make yourself known. May you tear down any walls or blinders that we may have that is hindering us from seeing you, for seeing your glory. God, we thank you for how your goodness chases after us, how you relentlessly pursue us. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's gathered here in person and those online. We think of those people, God, that are battling illnesses, that are battling cancer, that are battling relationship issues, finances, God. May you see, God, may they see, God, that you are with them in the battle. May they see that you, indeed, are for them. Give them the strength, the courage to continue putting one step in front of the other. May they seek your face. May we thank you, God, that when we seek you, when we look for you, that you will be found. May we thank you, God, that we can exchange our weakness for your strength, that we, we can come in our sorrow and grief, and in you we find hope and healing, that you are able to bring joy even in the midst of our pain, because in your presence there is power and there is peace. So we thank you, Father. As we open your word this morning, Again, God, open our eyes to be able to see you. Help our hearts to be able to receive it. And then may we apply it to our lives, God. May we not just hear and see, but may we follow through. So we thank you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Have you ever experienced a prolonged season when it feels life just keeps knocking you down, that no matter what is going on, that it just seems to keep going, that bad news seems to be lurking around the corner. If so, you're not alone. As we'll see today, just because you withstand one attack from the enemy, it doesn't mean the battle is over. We have been talking about Jesus in the wilderness journey. And last week we saw how Jesus responded to Satan's first temptation was, God's word and God's will wins the battle. God's word and God's will wins the battle. Jesus relied on the word of God to respond to the devil. He didn't use long, clever speeches to try to convince him. He just quoted, quoted scripture. Jesus trusted in God's word. Jesus trusted in God's will. That Satan tried to use Jesus' pain of hunger as an opportunity to tempt Jesus to focus on himself and on his own power, and not on the purpose and plan of God. Jesus trusted in God's will. He trusted in God's love and goodness. When we allow our thoughts to be consumed with satisfying our own needs, we are drawn into that snare of worry. 
Worry is defined as allowing one's mind to dwell on difficulties or troubles. Worry will strangle the life, the hope, and peace out of us. But the word of God will cut through its vice-like grip and allow peace to guard our hearts. Jesus knew that, that he was able to stand strong and resist Satan's first temptation, overcome those hungry pains, because he knew God's word and God's will wins the battles. So Jesus overcame it, but Satan doesn't leave. The devil isn't discouraged, so he tries again. You see, he has a well-proven strategy because temptation has a revealing effect. It uncovers the heart's desires, proving both the depth and the direction of your conviction. It shows what you are really committed to, what captures your deepest affections. The question Satan is really asking Jesus, and he's asking us today, has God captured your deepest attention? Are you following his ways or the ways of the world? You see, Satan is hoping and he's planning that Jesus, like Adam and the nation of Israel, that Jesus will repeat those same patterns. What was their patterns? They looked for their own interest, not trusting in God and not following his ways, but their own self-centered desires. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're focusing on verses 5 to 7. Remember this setting, this is in the wilderness. Jesus has gone 40 days fasting and praying and he is hungry. He's overcome the first temptation of turning the stones into bread. So verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are, if you are the Son of God, for the scriptures say, he will order your, his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. This time, Satan uses Jesus' own tactic. He quotes scripture. In this passage, what Satan quoted was a portion of Psalms 91. And obviously... The devil is familiar with God's word. The Bible teaches us that demons believed in one God, that they recognized Jesus as a holy one of God, that there's a difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. They knew God, they knew his word, but they did not embrace his love. They did not embrace, they did not allow Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. And so the devil uses God's word, twist it for his own benefit. And this is why it's so important to know God's word, to understand the whole narrative of the Bible, or we too, others, can also speak half-truths. Because the devil uses the scripture out of context. He only quotes a portion See, this psalm is a psalm of trust. The psalmist is asserting God's protective care for the faithful in Israel. Verses 9 and 12 basically say that no evil will come upon those who dwelling place and refuge are with the Lord. For God's angels will protect the servants of God whom have trouble come upon them not those who deliberately put themselves in harm way to see if God would save them. You see, the Satan is trying to twist this context out of context to try to force Jesus to jump from the temple to convince him that he really does live 
by every word that comes from God. You see, the second test strikes at the heart of the victory of the first test. The devil urges Jesus to throw himself upon, down from that high place, so his loving Father will send angels to rescue him. What better way for Jesus to launch his public ministry with a spectacular show of power? The complete opposite of what's happening in the wilderness journey where Jesus is weak and vulnerable as he fasts and he prays to God again, for that union, for direction, for his ministry. Satan is showing him a different way. Satan is essentially saying, I hear that you say you are able to be weak physically. You are able to rely on God to strengthen you with your hunger pains. Since you trust him and are obedient to him, he's able to meet your physical needs. What about the spiritual Again, if you are the Son of God. Or it could be read, since you are the Son of God, show me, show me, prove to me, show me. It says the angels won't let a stone hurt your foot. Jump, go ahead and jump. Do you remember Van Halen's song, Jump, Jump, Just Go Ahead and Jump? That's the sea theme song that is playing. You see, Satan is trying to test Jesus, to test Jesus and his father in two ways. By intentionally putting himself in harm's way, Jesus would be inappropriately testing his father's love, trying to manipulate him to send a rescuing force of angels. True love asks no such demands. Often, abusive relationships are all about manipulation, if you loved me, dot, dot, dot. Second way Satan is trying to test Jesus is if Jesus were to cast him off that high place of the temple and as the angels rescued him, think of the reaction of the people. Such a spectacular display would gain Jesus a messianic following but it would not follow God's design. Now we know that Jesus has the power to do what the devil's tempting to do. Later in Matthew, just prior to the arrest and crucifixion, Jesus states that if he wanted to, he could call his father to rescue him by sending him more than 12 legions of angels. Again, we see how Satan is trying to misuse scripture to try to manip manipulate Jesus. The original Old Testament context does not imply that God will send protective care for every harmful situation. You see, Jesus sees right through the use of Satan's quoting scripture because Jesus knows Satan's motive. Jesus is, in fact, being challenged to confirm the relationship he has with the Father. Does the Father really love him? Prove it by sending help. Does the Father really know the best way to gain following? Watch the reaction a jump will produce. I can imagine that Jesus can see the crowds of people that, that are gathered in the temple. That he, Again, he's way up at the top. And most likely, Satan is pointing to the crowd, trying to convince them this is an amazing opportunity to show your trust in God. This is the quickest way to create a following. Do something spectacular. Be the star in your own story. People are looking. People want to follow a celebrity. People will share your jump with millions of people you will be an instant YouTube sensation. You will be instantly liked. Everybody will be talking to you. This is the easiest way to make a name for yourself. Be the king people are looking for. Imagine in that brief second as he's looking 
kind of knowing the hearts of people. A crown without a cross would have sounded pretty good to Jesus. But Jesus knew exactly what his purpose was, to give his life as a ransom for many. Satan is offering a different story, a story without suffering, a story without a cross. But Jesus knows who he is, that he knows the will of God. So Jesus again responds by quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. He refuses to play in this game and instead remains, has that confident trust in his father that he doesn't need to ask God for a demonstration of his love and protection. He accepts it from his word. God already declared in his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That those words continue to ring in Jesus' head. That no matter all the other babblings that is taking place, that he is able to remain secure and steadfast in that truth, that he is a beloved son of God. And God is well pleased. And God is well pleased before there is miracles, before his teaching, before the following. God is well pleased. That's the essence of biblical faith, taking God at his word, letting it penetrate your mind and heart. That's why so often I talk about that, that once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have a new identity, that you're God's beloved, chosen child. And that's why it's so important to have that, to know that identity. So when, not if, but when, that you are in these battles, that you are able to strand, stand strong, knowing who you, who you are and who God is. And then you're able to stay on the course. Jesus is able to stay on the course with his temptation. He isn't thrown off by Satan quoting scripture. Jesus responds confidently, perhaps with a stronger tone, his voice getting a little bit louder. Scripture also says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. This reference is from Deuteronomy 6.16. It says, you must not test the Lord your God as you did when you complained at Mesa. Deuteronomy 6 is a chapter in the law that is foundational to Israel's faith. It has that creedal statement and it says, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. The chapter is, exhorts the people to obey God's commands and to do what is good and right before him. And why the context of this passage in Deuteronomy 6 was dedicated to teaching the Israelites how they were to honor God when they arrived and when they lived in the promised land. Jesus is specifically selecting this verse because it referred to the time when the Israelites tested the Lord in the wilderness. They refused to believe that God was with them until he provided water from a rock as a sign he was leading them. And if you know the story, you can read more about it in Exodus, that, that Jesus, that, that it talks about the angel of the Lord was always with them, pillar of the cloud, and then at nighttime with a fire. And Exodus 17, 7 says, Moses named the place Mesa, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us or not? You see, the moment someone puts God to the test, that person gives evidence that he or she doesn't really trust God. So Jesus shuts his conversation down completely and quickly with Satan and saying, I'm not going to test God's word by doing something foolish at your prompting, that Jesus is able to show his confident love and trust in the Father. 
the devil tempted Jesus to see himself in a different story. One, he implied, would be better if Jesus took matters into his own hands. Jesus discerned the temptation by remembering the real story he was in, which the entire Old Testament reveals, that he had come to undo the curse of the fall, that catastrophic results of Adam believing a false story. Jesus was able to overcome the temptation because he trusted in God. Jesus came to rescue us from the evil one, to restore us in the right relationship with God. Jesus trusted in God's love and God's purpose for his love. We know that as we see how Jesus willingly and immediately went to the cross because he trusted in God's redemptive plan. Jesus knew there was going to be pain and suffering, hardships and aches along the way, but he trusted in God. He trusted in God. And the question we often ask ourselves is, how do we overcome temptation? That we see by this second example is trusting in God overcomes temptation. And there's purpose for that preposition, trusting in God. This is not trusting in yourself or your own strength. It is relying on a power that is greater than yours. A power that overcomes sin and death power that is available to each one of us, that all you have to do is ask. What is beautiful and unique about Christianity is that God does not force his love upon anyone. It's all about a choice. In the book I Never Knew, Philip Yancey writes this, God's terrible insistence on human freedom, freedom, is so absolute that he granted us the power to live as though he did not exist, to spit in his face, to crucify him. Although power can force obedience, only love can summon a response of love. Only love can summon a response of love which is the one thing God wants from us and the reason he created us. God's nature is self-giving. He bases his appeal on sacrificial love. That is why you can trust God. That you can trust God in whatever situation that you find yourself today, whether it's finances, health issues, relationship issues, and that does not mean that instantly the battle will be over. That as we see from scripture, Jesus is still in the battle. But what it means is that he will give you the strength to overcome. He will give you the words. That he will comfort you with his presence. Because in his presence, there is peace and there's power, power to overcome. Jesus knew his father's love. That he knew he didn't have to demand any miraculous sign to ask him to prove it. But you know what? Our Heavenly Father proved his love for us. Jesus proved his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Corinthians chapter 13, that great passage on love, says, Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. That was a type of love that Jesus had for you and I when he was in this battle, when he was in the wilderness with Satan. That he had you and I on his mind. That's what gave him the strength to overcome. That he was able to trust in his father's plan that even though he knew it involved pain and suffering but he also knew it 
also involves incredible joy, incredible life transformation and freedom, that that pain, that suffering was all worth it. So Jesus was able to say no, to say no, that he chose a crown with a cross for you and I. So if you're in a situation that you find really hard today, I pray that you would continue to lean in to God, that you continue to trust him in his love, in his goodness, in his grace, so that you can overcome. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, that we thank you for your relentless pursuit of us for your amazing love, for your amazing goodness, how it chases after us. And God, as the worship team comes up to sing this last song, may we, even if we find ourselves just struggling today, God, may we be able to sing this. May we be able to put our trust in you. And for those today that are that are doting, that are struggling, I pray that you would reveal yourself in a special, powerful way. May you show them your love, your grace, your mercy. We just thank you. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. We'll ask that you stand with us. We, um, my family was in Gemseg on Friday, and we went to the Gemseg Baptist Church, and Reverend Chris Price um, is there, and he, he, he had a little catchphrase almost, and he said, that should get you excited, and if you're not excited, you'd better check your exciter, because your exciter's broken. <laughs> so this song gets me excited, so hopefully... It gets you excited.
the middle of a storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Hope from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Amen. May you go with the love of the Father, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Have a great week, and we hope to see some of you tonight at 6.30 for prayer. Thank you.